And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has ordered his military to boost its strike capability. He called for full combat posture as he directed his country's latest missile launch. Japan insists North Korea's latest missile launch has violated the UN's ban on such weapons tests. Now, Tom Plant is the Director of for Proliferation and Nuclear Policy at the Royal United Services Institute in the United Kingdom and the world's oldest independent think tank on international defense and security. And he joins us now. Firstly, Tom, what can we read into these missile launches? Uh, hi there. Yeah, there's, I think there's three main angles we should be looking at here with these launches. Uh, the first one is obviously the diplomatic signaling element, which I think a lot of people are are picking up on, you know, the pressure that the North Koreans are trying to put on the South Koreans, but also on the US. So that's angle one. The second angle is sort of around North Korea's own capabilities, right? These systems are, are genuinely for a defense purpose, for a deterrence purpose. They really want to use them in their military, so there is a real test element to it. But the third one is, I think, one that's being sort of overlooked, and that's the fact that this is really a shop window as well. You know, North Korea has a record of selling weapons technologies, ballistic missiles, even nuclear technologies around the world. And this is basically showing prospective customers alongside those other two reasons. You know, this is this is what we have for sale if you uh, if you're willing to buy. OK, but wouldn't these missile launches like, you know, actually violate UN Security Council resolutions? Yes, they do. Um, there's UN Security Council resolutions that bar all North Korean development of ballistic missile systems, and this quite clearly falls into that category. It's a, it's a pretty unambiguous case. I mean, of course, North Korea has been violating a number of UN Security Council resolutions in relation to the continued development of its missile program, but also its nuclear weapons uh, and other issues. So in, in of itself, this violation itself, I mean, it's more high profile, but the violations have been continuing, you know, throughout the course of the last year and a half of summit diplomacy. Well, speaking of the summit diplomacy, there was no success in the one in Vietnam in Hanoi. And then recently Kim Jong-un has visited uh, Russia's President Putin. Is, does, it seem, does this seem out of, out of sort of the direction that things were heading in to go back to sort of missile tests? Well, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's not a positive development. Of course, it says that, you know, North Korea is looking to uh, signal to uh, the U.S. and to South Korea that there are costs for not engaging in the way that North Korea wants them to uh, in, the, in the summit process. But on the other hand, it's fairly well calibrated. I mean, um, North Korea had, you know, had a unilateral moratorium on longer range missile testing and nuclear testing, which these short range missile tests don't breach. So in terms of North Korea's own declaratory policy towards this process, we're not seeing a contradiction there. We're not seeing a change there. Yes, so yes, they are turning up the heat, uh, but they're not sort of, you know, ending this process. They're really trying to create leverage and pressure within it. Well, you know, China has called for a practical roadmap to denuclearization, but then the question is what sort of details should a map like this actually contain? Yeah, right. So, I mean, we, we heard in uh, the aftermath of the Hanoi summit, you know, North Korea's very maximalist offer on what it would look to get from the U.S. Uh, in relation to sort of freezing, a, you know, a significant but not, not a total part of its, uh, of its nuclear weapons program and nothing on ballistic missiles. Uh, and China, I think, well, it would be sympathetic to North Korea's, you know, demands for early sanctions relief. That's a fairly consistent Chinese and, for that matter, Russian position. Um, you know, I don't think it would have supported that very, uh, you know, that very full-throated approach, if you, if you like. I mean, the conversations that the U.S. is having and the, the, North, the, the lines that the U.S. has and that North Korea has around what denuclearization might look like are, are just very, very different. And while I think they, they can be reconciled, unfortunately, it seems to me that after, you know, many months, year and a half, as I say, of this, this summit process, those two sides are, don't appear to be significantly closer together. It's not clear to me that the U.S. is recognizing that need for really substantial early sanctions relief from the North Korean perspective, or that the North is willing to look beyond giving up its nuclear complex at, at Yongbyon. Right, indeed. Thanks so much for those uh, analysis there, Tom. Speaking to Tom Platt, their Director of Proliferation and Nuclear Policy at the Royal United Services Institute in the United Kingdom.